morning everybody welcome again to another week and um, it's great to be together in our own homes uh, knowing that we're united by his Holy Spirit so yeah welcome to anyone that's watching this Berniston Methodist Church online you are all welcome and if you need any prayer or practical help please don't hesitate to um, get in touch via our website and uh, our Facebook page so please do if you're new to us and you want to make contact we'd love to hear from you now this week in the church calendar it's been about um, the ascension of Jesus when Jesus went back to heaven to return to his father and um, it's David's going to be bringing the message later on to us and he will be telling us more about um, Jesus' ascension. Now before he left, Jesus told his followers to wait for the gift that was going to um, that they were going to receive later on. And they went away back to a room and they waited. Now I think we can all relate to that sense of waiting. We're all waiting until we return to, um, well we can wait to hear that, for that message to say it's okay. You can come out and you can go and do things and see your loved ones again. And I for one just, I am excited about that. So I uh, can't wait to see friends and family, especially our granddaughter Imogen. So after they'd done that, they did wait. And we know that later on, the Holy Spirit arrived. Now as believers, we know that the Holy Spirit is already living in us and we can rejoice in that knowledge that's not something we have to hang around waiting for that is something that's real to us already and he gives us the power to be more like jesus in every way and every day and knowing jesus is the best way and we thank you jesus that you have given us everything that we need to live the best life and Lord you know us and you love us so I'm going to start um, let's um, let's pray and then I'll tell you what's going to happen next so let's uh, have a moment to pray Lord Jesus we thank you that you've sent your Holy Spirit to live in us and we rejoice that your presence is constantly with us. Lord, we ask that you will fill us afresh with your energy, renew our minds, give us a new imagination to perceive new possibilities today. Give us ideas and creative ways that we can share the good news of knowing you Jesus especially in these times of non-contact help us to know how we can share your good news we pray for our families our neighbours and communities our nation that they will seek your face reveal yourself to them in extraordinary ways so that they may come to know you Heighten our sensitivity to your promptings to respond to the opportunities you give us to share your love and grace with others. Lord, thank you that we can wait on you and you always turn up and you're always with us. We love you, Lord. Amen. Now, the next bit of our service is going to be led by our young people 
who are going to bless us with the Lord's Prayer. So don't close your eyes for this prayer. Keep them wide open and watch all of our young people telling us more about the prayer that Jesus left us with about his father, the provider. So be blessed today and enjoy uh, the rest of the service and God bless. Our Father, who is in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen! The reading is from Luke 24, verses 44 to 53. Then he said to them, These are the very things I told you about while I was still with you, everything written about me in the law of Moses, the writings of the prophets and the Psalms had to come true. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, This is what is written, the Messiah must suffer and must rise from death three days later and in his name, the message about repentance and the forgiveness of sins must be preached to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and I myself will send upon you what my father has promised. But you must wait in the city until the power from above comes down upon you. Then he led them out of the city as far as Bethany, where he raised his hands and blessed them. As he was blessing them, he departed from them and was taken up into heaven. They worshipped him and went back to Jerusalem, filled with great joy, and spent all their time in the temple giving thanks to God. The Gospel of the Lord. We've got a riddle for you. What has a soul but no body? It needs healing, but it has no wound. It has a tongue, but no mouth. It can be any length, but it's always a foot. It must always accept defeat. Shoes! Yes, we're shoes! First, we chose sandals. These make me think of summer and warm weather. They are also quite like the sort of shoes Jesus would have worn. He was a child and a teenager. He knew the same temptations and difficulties as us. He walked, taught and healed. He was sad, lonely and tired. He took all these experiences into heaven. He can understand me and talk to the Father directly with real feeling for my situation. He prays for me. In fact, he's talking about you and me in heaven now. Football boots. These football boots remind me of a football victory. When the winning team goes up to fetch the cup and everyone cheers, we've won, even though the fans themselves haven't even touched the ball. Jesus, at his ascension, goes up to collect the cup from the Easter victory. And if we're in his team, we too can say, we've won. We can share in the joy and excitement of his victory right here on earth, whatever our situation is. Slippers. Where do you normally wear slippers? We wear ours at home when we're relaxing or resting. These remind me that Jesus at his ascension went home to heaven. 
back to be with his father, welcomed by angels. And because he is at home, we can trust that we too will find a home in heaven with him. How? Because the entry price to heaven has been paid for us at Easter. Jesus paid that price and the marks of the nails are still visible in heaven to prove the price was paid. Jesus has been in our shoes on earth so that one day we can be in his shoes in heaven. This is the truth of the ascension. Jesus wore our shoes on earth. He now wants to go on walking in our shoes through the Holy Spirit. Ours will be the feet which he uses to go on walking this earth to heal and transform this world. Lord, I know I am your creation and you designed me just the way you wanted me to be. Please show me the talents you've given me and help me use them in ways that make you smile and help others see you. Amen. Dear God, there are so many things I don't understand, but there's one thing I do know. You are always good and I can always trust you. Thank you for having good plans for my life. Amen. Lord, I know my actions. Send a message to everyone around me. Please help me make that message a loving one that points people back to you. Amen. This Bible reading is from the book of Acts, chapter 1, verses 1 to 14. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised you, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptised with water, but in a few days you will be baptised with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered round him and asked him, Lord, at this time, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men, dressed in white, stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James and Andrew. Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Amen.
We begin with a prayer, the collect for Ascension Day. Eternal and gracious God, grant that as we believe your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, to have ascended with triumph into your kingdom in heaven, so may we also in heart and mind ascend to where he is, and with him continually dwell, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen. Last Thursday was Ascension Day, and the Ascension tradition provides a key moment in the theological pilgrimage of the early Jesus movement. Now the Ascension comes right at the beginning of the Acts of the Apostles. All that is to follow is seen from this perspective. The Ascension is the climax of the disciples' Easter journey of faith experience. From the crucified Jesus to the risen Jesus, here with the Ascension, they see that Jesus is the Christ, glorified for all time and eternity. Only when they have owned this Easter truth of the glorified Jesus are they ready to become church, to organise themselves as a missionary movement and to receive the empowering of the Spirit at Pentecost. So may we also in heart and mind ascend to where he is and with him continually dwell. As the disciples are formed into a movement for mission, the Ascension helps us to see clearly the theological movement of God's love in all its splendour and its beauty. The Incarnation and the Ascension are the opening and closing movements of theological disclosure within which the life of Jesus is to be understood. Without the Incarnation and the Ascension, we would be left with the man Jesus, a particular Jew, living in a particular place, at a particular time in history. A charismatic Galilean healer and teacher who put people in touch with God and each other in heart-breakingly life-giving ways. Now that is indeed life-enhancing news. But it is not life-giving news, it is not gospel, nor is it true to the faith of the Church, rooted as it is in the faith experience of the Apostles. Add these opening and closing movements of divine revelation, and we discover the Christ of our personal and communal faith experience a living saviour, universally present within and beyond space-time itself, who touches our lives through the enfolding love of God, which we call the Holy Spirit. Only with the Incarnation and Ascension can we comprehend Jesus as the human face of God. Only with the movements of Incarnation and Ascension can we make sense of the One in whose gaze you and I meet divine love face to face. Now Incarnation speaks of a God who is always reaching down into the very heartbreaking depths of what it is to be human. A God of grace who is reaching out to us before ever we reach out. A God who chooses to be alongside us in the muck and the mess and the muddle and the squalor and the anguish and the tears of our brokenness and our broken world. An intimate God, a God face to face in Jesus who enfolds, embraces and encircles us. A God face to face in Jesus who touches and who can be touched. A God face to face in Jesus who risks the pain of rejection and bears the pain of suffering because love knows no other way. A God who in love and for love and through love comes to us and stays with us no matter the cost. So why bother with the Ascension? Doesn't the Incarnation say all that needs to be said? After all, 
Isn't the ascension little more than a case of tidying up the loose ends and clearing the way for the Holy Spirit to enter stage left for a rousing encore at Pentecost? Well, for Luke, obviously not. And why? Because the ascension expresses the essential truth of our faith experience, that Jesus is Lord and Saviour, Jesus is the risen, cosmic Christ. If in the Incarnation we express the truth that God reaches out to us in Jesus, through the Ascension we express the life-giving truth that in Christ we are taken into the very heart of God. So may we also, in heart and mind, ascend to where he is, and with him continually dwell. The life of Jesus Christ is universally and eternally significant because the truth which the Ascension story expresses is a paradigm shift from the particular to the universal, from the limited to the limitless, from time to eternity, from the local to the global, from the centre to the edge, from humanity to God, from Jesus to the Christ. From the bitter down-to-earth reality of crucifixion, the gaze of the disciples is drawn to heaven and the universal truth of Christ. The God who comes to us in Jesus is the God who in Christ yearns to draw everyone to himself. From being the disciples' personal story in their time and their land, Christ now becomes everyone's story, everywhere, for all eternity. So may we also, in heart and mind, ascend to where he is and with him continually dwell. So let's look at a photograph of the glass west screen of Coventry Cathedral and try and pull this together. Here you see the ground level part of the great glass frontage. Prominent are John Hutton's glass engravings, which intersect the moment with a bold statement of faith. Looking left to right they are, on the bottom row, the Angel of Resurrection, the Angel of Ascension, and the angel with the eternal gospel, the latter being badly damaged by thieves in January of this year. Above them are St Hilda, St Bede, St Margaret of Scotland and St Alfred. The glass interrupts our usual everyday way of seeing with the transparent truth of the wonder and mystery of a divine presence which transforms our understanding and brings to life our faith and mission. Here, what is behind and what is ahead are brought together in the surface of the glass. What is inside and what is outside are united. Everything is seen as one and held by the glass screen. All is revealed. So may we also, in heart and mind, ascend to where he is and with him continually dwell. The ascension serves Luke's purpose just like the glass in the photograph. The movement of God deep down into the world's longing through the incarnation flows through into the counterpart movement of God in Christ, bringing and reconciling everything to himself. And like the disciples, we see clearly God's intention and God's action. Because in this moment of revelation, God's presence is unmistakable as eternity breaks through and heaven touches the earth and Jesus ascends. All is held together in one moment of startling perception. And for the disciples, the penny finally drops. The 40 days after Easter mark the probationary period for the first disciples. They were chosen and followed Jesus to the cross. 
They encountered the risen Jesus and began to assimilate what this meant for their identity and continuing vocation as witnesses to God's kingdom purpose in the life and death of Jesus. At the beginning of the book of Acts, Luke describes the 40-day period from Easter to Ascension as one in which, time and again, Jesus appeared convincingly to the disciples. It is as though they were in their probationary period and Jesus had to be sure they were ready to be commissioned and sent out in mission. He will not leave them unless and until they are ready for the task which awaits them. So clearly again and again he speaks about the kingdom of God and if bringing the kingdom of God to a needy world is their task, he also promises them the power with which to achieve it, the Holy Spirit. Until then, they are to stay where they are. Two things seem to be essential. Firstly, that once and for all, they truly get their heads around the fact that God's priority is the inbreaking of the kingdom of love, and that this must be their first priority too. Putting faith into practical and radical action is at the very heart of what it is to be a disciple of Jesus. And secondly, it follows that this is only possible if they really do trust that Jesus will always be with them at the very centre of their being. Luke tells us that they asked Jesus a question. Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? It's not a good question, as it betrays their lack of comprehension about just what God is up to and about to do through them. God has no intention of being confined to their limited imaginations. This is not about restoring a long-lost monarchy to Israel. Still less is it about what Jesus is going to do for them. It's a question that says so much of their need for clarity and certainty. Is this the time? Is this the time when you will put things right just as they once were? Well, as we struggle through lockdown, we have so many questions like these too. Like the disciples, we crave clarity and certainty. We too want facts we can trust rather than the confused and confusing whiff-waff of promises, which are all too soon and all too often broken. So Jesus lets them down gently by saying that it's not for them to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority. Then he turns their question on its head and gives them an answer they did not expect. It is not about Jesus restoring anything. It is about what they are going to do. Jesus says to them, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And the commas in that sentence really matter, because the pauses are vital. Jesus has just shocked them into a new and thrilling paradigm shift. He has put before them an unexpected, daunting and yet thrilling prospect. His mission is now theirs to accomplish. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, says Jesus. Pause. Let that sink in. And you can imagine the internal monologue going on in each disciple's mind. Um, so this is about us and what we have to do? Oh, that's not what I expected. I thought Jesus would lead and we would follow. But the Holy Spirit is going to empower us. And after the pause, this and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. They are going to be his witnesses. They are going to bring God's radical kingdom of love to birth, starting with the place and people they know well. Pause. Let that sink in. 
So we are going to have to speak about Jesus to others? We are going to have to do evangelism on our own? We are going to have to do mission on our own? And after the pause, this. In all Judea and Samaria. Pause. Now let that sink in. And again, you can imagine the internal monologue going on in each disciple's mind. OK, that feels much more uncomfortable, but we can do it. We must do it. Jesus believes in us. And after the pause, this. And to the ends of the earth. Starting with their fears and almost crippling uncertainty, starting with the lockdown of their imaginations, Jesus leads them step by step from the narrow radius of what they think might happen and he takes them step by step right out to the unlimited radius which is God's all-encompassing love, a circumference which includes everyone and all creation. Job done. Then Jesus ascends to heaven, and the disciples stand still, staring skywards, lost in the moment. And as if to emphasise the urgency of the task that Jesus has just given them, two angels bring the disciples' attention back down to earth with a very pointed question. Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? Come on, you lot, you've work to do. Get a move on. And the little group of disciples, including many women and Jesus' family, his mother and brothers, give us the signature hallmark of authentic Christianity as church. Luke tells us they were constantly devoting themselves to prayer. Right here, at the very beginning of the church, prayer is essential. It is what roots them in the movement of God reaching out to a locked down humanity and in Christ lifting them up into the light of God's salvation. The same sense is there too in Luke's Gospel and his Easter Day quasi-ascension story. Here Luke is concerned with the reassurance the disciples need that Jesus is indeed the fulfilment of prophecy, promise and history. In the risen Jesus their religion has taken a decisive new turn. Repentance and forgiveness of sins are to be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. Once again the task is given to the disciples. No longer is forgiveness tied down to particular places and people and rituals. It is let loose throughout the whole world through their mission and ministry. God comes to where you are in your need. Once again, the promise of the Holy Spirit is given to the disciples. And finally, as his last act on this Easter evening, Jesus blesses his friends and is carried up to heaven. For 40 days he will return and spend time with them. So this is not his ascension as described in chapter 1 of Acts when he enters into glory for the final time. But it is the moment when those disciples worship Jesus as the risen Christ of God. And for Luke, the ascension is the moment when all of this snaps into sharp focus and becomes crystal clear. So on the edge of Pentecost, at the end of their probationary period, the first disciples are like the trees in this photograph. They have grown and they have matured. Now they stretch and grow upwards, into the glorious light of God's eternal love in Jesus Christ, glorified and ascended. And now their whole being has come alive in a living canopy of faith, synthesising commitment to energise, sustain and nourish their holy calling. The one who calls them is the one who lifts them to himself. Their souls open out, and they flourish and they live life in its fullness. 
so may we also in heart and mind ascend to where he is and with him continually dwell. And they grow upwards through Christ into the heart of God because now they are rooted deep down into the troubled earth of life, their very being planted for the sake of nurturing godly community and transformative hope. They are deep-rooted into the presence of Jesus Christ and the soil of the kingdom of love. They are deep-rooted into the needs of the world. They are deep-rooted into God's passion and purpose. They are deep-rooted in prayer. Like children playing on a rope swing, hung from the strong branch of an old sturdy tree, by the end of this 40-day probation, they have learned to let God take all the weight. They have learned to live freely, joyfully and purposefully in the reality of God's loving presence. Their discipleship pivots around God alone and their energetic delight accelerates them along an exuberant arc of grace. They have accepted the truth that the strong rope of God's love for them in Jesus Christ will never fray or break. So may we also, in heart and mind, ascend to where he is and with him continually dwell. In 40 days, they have changed from being fearful and frightened into trusting, confident, passionate and kingdom-focused disciples. So Jesus knows that they are ready for Pentecost. Now they would no longer be in need of convincing proofs. From now on, they were to be the proof for others of the living truth of Jesus Christ. They would become energised into an unstoppable movement. The spirit which was so manifest in Jesus, the spirit at the heart of God's continuing creation, was soon to be self-evidently present in them too. So may we, also in heart and mind, ascend to where he is and with him continually dwell. As we look forward to Pentecost, we stand where the disciples stood. Like them, we are held transfixed by the glory of the ascended Christ. And like them, we are primed for mission. The ascension really matters. So may we also, in heart and mind, ascend to where he is and with him continually dwell. May God bless you richly as you live from the heart of this most wonderful truth. As we gather together today, no amount of physical distance between us can prevent God's work here on earth and nothing can separate us from the love of God. So let us come boldly before God's throne of grace, for we are his royal priesthood and a holy nation. Our Father in heaven hears our prayers, and Jesus, our risen Lord, who has ascended to the right hand of God, is interceding for us every time we pray. Let us bow our heads as we say the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory now and forever. Amen. 
using the Methodist Church Prayer for Ascension Sunday. Let us pray. Every day, God, we praise you that you are with us in every part of our lives and you never stop loving us. We praise you for the world you created and the beautiful things we see around us. We praise you that you came to earth in Jesus to show us in person how much you care about us and the world we live in. As we remember your ascension, we thank you that you did not leave us alone, but sent your spirit so that we can always know you are with us. You invite us to join in your work of loving people and the planet, and we pray that you show us how we can share in your mission of love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, as we grow closer to you in difficult times, we thank you that isolation is actually strengthening our unity and fellowship at Berniston. Teach us, Holy Spirit, to hear you prompting us to reach out to each other prayerfully, imaginatively, restoratively. Let us not hide the gifts you have anointed us with, our ideas, ourselves, our acts of kindness under the bed. Let's not do that. Let us pause to ask God to increase our desire and really ask him for these gifts. Give us a fresh anointing of your Holy Spirit, we pray. Father God, we want to obediently connect with and bless each person we meet, either virtually or face to face. Teach us to receive as well as to give, for this is your desire to bless us, our God of abundance. We praise you that this is your nature and you have created us to do the same. As you have revealed to us that there is much work to do in your name, Give us, Lord, eyes that see, hearts that care, and hands that serve. Forgive us when we are unkind or neglectful of each other. We are sorry. Let us pause for a moment. Show us who we can help, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for your kindness and faithfulness to us. As you are anointing and equipping us with many resources, help us to mobilise these, even in lockdown. May we use this time as a God-given opportunity to be generous with our time, money, skills, gifts of food, to show kindness in our suffering community. Bountiful Lord, you are already showing us how much can be achieved when we can all pull together. We thank you for all those who work tirelessly behind the scenes, serving Berniston Church community, including virtual church, all the Zoom fellowship groups, prayer groups and ladies WhatsApp. We praise you, Lord, for making virtual church such a blessing and faith builder at Berniston. Thank you that this new way of worship and witness is drawing more people to the church. We pray that they would come to know you as their personal Lord and Saviour and to be fully birthed and baptised as new Christians. Lord, we are mindful of those among us who are unable to access virtual church or associated technologies. Please guide us with inspiring and practical solutions for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Let no one be left out. We ask, Lord, that you cover and protect our leadership, especially David and Graham. May you provide all they need for their families to uphold them as they steer the church through these difficult days. 
Help us as the body of Christ to remain strong and not be rocked by this turbulence. Jesus, you are in the boat with us and you will calm this storm. We pray for each other that your Holy Spirit would work in power, anointing, blessing and filling us all afresh in our different circumstances. We pray for our children and young people to grow closer to Jesus and rejoice as they blossom each day. Let us pause to lift each one dear to us in our families and community. Faithful God, we pray for and give thanks for teaching staff who have been keeping schools open for children of key workers. We lift up all these precious young ones, especially from the 1st of June when they will be joined by more children. We ask for hope where there is fear, for calm where there is strife, and for your loving protection over all children and staff. Father, we pray for those people who are suffering from this horrible virus. We ask that you be close beside them, laying your healing hand upon them. We thank you for so many answers to prayer, both in our church and across our land. Thank you, Lord. We cry out to you, Lord, for all the elderly folks suffering from the virus in care homes. Wrap your safety around them as well as the staff working so diligently in unsafe conditions. We pray for people to forgive the mistakes that have been made through wrong decisions. We are sorry for our accusatory thoughts and attitudes, ways and actions. Father, forgive us and forgive our government. May your kingdom be established where we live and may you heal our land. We thank you, merciful God, that we are seeing other countries coming out of lockdown. God of hope, we ask that you would miraculously restore our country. May people become aware that you, mighty God, are in the midst of us, healing us and identifying with our pain. We lift to you all who are in mourning because of loved ones lost to coronavirus. We lift to you all NHS staff in overwhelming situations. Comfort them, Lord, we pray. Show us how to weep with those who weep and be a welcome support. We pray your peace, your shalom, your wholeness into every troubled situation known to us. Thank you, Father God, for placing so many Christians in our government Give them faith, wisdom and courage as they make crucial decisions in the coming days. We are glad that our government is providing financial support and ask that you would continue to prompt them to meet the needs of our country with compassion and wisdom. Father God, we lift up to you the poorer countries where inadequate infrastructure and governance is causing enormous suffering. Refugees are living in appalling and dangerous conditions. We pray that you will raise up champions, strategically placing Christians in desperate communities. We ask, dear Lord, Prince of Peace, that you would bring calm and stability into all the situations we're praying into today. We pray your peace, your shalom, your wholeness into every troubled situation. Let us pause to reflect and pray for people known to us who are in difficulty, pain, loneliness and suffering. Come, Lord Jesus. We are definitely seeing the winds of change. 
May your Holy Spirit move across the United Kingdom, a strong but gentle breeze. May your Ruach, your breath, your winds of change, touch every household and every individual. Help us to be still and know that you are God. May we humble ourselves before you now. Lord, heal our land. Let your kingdom come. Our hearts cry out that in the coming weeks and months, we would feel your loving safety. May our homes be the dwellings of the shelter of the Most High. For then we shall not fear the deadly pestilence, which shall not come near our tent. Amen. 